here we are again, another episode of the Uncommon Leadership Podcast. And today we're around the table with Pastor Shane, and we're missing a few people today. We're missing a few. The dogs are here, but uh, the people are gone. So People are gone. I don't know if we've got any uh, little microphones for them. Hopefully not, because they make all sorts of funny noises. But anyway, it's so, great to be here. It is. So today's episode, we're going to um, delve into and talk a little bit more about the book. The book. Only Believe, released this year. Was it this year? Yep. Yeah, released this year. Um, it's, a lead, it's a book about leadership. Yep. It's a book about uh, faith. Yep. Um, it's a book about the enjoy story. Yep. So I'm really excited to unpack some chapters of that today. Yeah, so we can unpack the chapters. And for me, just so you know, as we jump in, uh, even though you've just said it's about the book, it's actually not about the book. What you're saying is right, though. It's about faith, because that's really what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about faith, because the faith journey, for your faith journey is different to my faith journey. Mm. Our faith journey is different to their faith journey. We've all got a different faith journey. Everyone listening in today has got a different faith journey. And, you know, faith at the end of the day is really what is going to propel us into the life that Christ has got for us yeah. as faith works within us and then through us and from us and into our future and into our destinies as we continue to step in Christ into all the things he's got for us. So that's why I really want to just spend some time today just back, backward yeah, and forward okay. and really let people in. And like you say, we, we can talk about the book. The book tells the story, yeah. really, because at the end of the day, the Enjoy story is a, a story of 25 years of faith and even beyond that. But it's uh, I, personally, I think it's a great story. It's a good story, not because it's my story and our story, but it is a journey of faith. And you can really see the steps of faith yeah. that have led us to getting here today. Yeah, personally, what I loved about it, and I got to read it early on, the manuscript says it came through, Sue Marshall sent them through and, yeah, yeah. and um, I was reading it and um, it was just like you talking. <laughs> um, and I knew a lot of the stories, but in part, yeah. because you, you weave them into your sermons and you weave them into your altar calls often, yeah? Um, and to, hear, to, to actually hear your voice was pretty cool because... A, some people, when they write something like this, they'll get someone else to write it for them. So they take the story yeah, yeah. and then they pretty it up and they yeah. sound very elegant and very professional. There, there's words in here that I would say they're not English words correctly spelt, but it's, it's you talking. Um, and you can hear your voice, but also, um, as I was telling my kids earlier this week, we're listening to the Highwaymen. Highway yeah. um, so Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson. And, and I said, hey, guys, listen to their storytelling because it's real and you can tell they've lived through it. So can I ask you a question? Why did you write this book? Why did I write the book? It's interesting. I'll answer that in just a minute. It's interesting that you, you were saying just then that you could hear my voice because before you came in, when you were getting your makeup done, because uh, it took a little while, probably took a, should have taken a bit longer, but anyway. And so, <laughs> but while, while we're waiting for you, we're talking about the fact, we're talking about the book and the amount of people that said, have said that as they read it, they can hear my voice. Yeah. They, they all say the same thing. For me personally, why I wrote the book, I didn't, as in, I, I never wanted to be an author. The truth is, as you know, I never actually wanted to be in ministry. Mm. As in, ministry came as a result of a desire that had something to do with something else. I wrote the book because I wanted people to understand the journey thus far. It, obviously, Enjoy Church has grown from 40-something people mm. to, to multi-thousands, multi-site, multi-nations, et cetera, et cetera. And how can, I, how can we sit with them and talk with them and share with them the journey? And so, and I'm aware that many of you, as you've read the book, were like, I didn't know about that story. I didn't know about that story. I didn't know about that story. We've all come in different parts. We know in part, we don't know in full. And this is only obviously a slice of a very big enjoy pizza pie. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, I wanted to be able to share the journey and include the faith story. Yeah. For, for me, it actually... Hopefully it brings hope to every person that is in Christ that God can use you. Yeah. God can use your family. God can use, it doesn't matter how, how together you think you are or how broken you think you are. God has got a plan and a purpose for you. And if you'll just continue to walk the walk of faith, keep turning up, keep going, overcome the disappointment, step it out, walk with your friends. Who knows what God can do? Yeah, that's really cool. So 
Today, I'm wondering if we can probably dive into and unpack yep. some chapters. We can't do all the chapters, but some chapters. Starting with a very interesting way to start a book, Jars of Clay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, and I, I, I'm, I'm listening to you say that anyone can. Yeah. And you start with this story, which is quite um, vulnerable. It's almost... Um, uh, it's the stories you typically don't tell about yourself. Um, I'm wondering if you can, we can just start talking about the first chapter, Jars of Clay. Yeah. So, so for me, and I, I know what you mean when you say typically don't tell about yourself because most pastors, leaders, aren't going to be necessarily completely transparent when it comes to their vulnerability and, yeah. and maybe their brokenness or their, their challenges. Glass, uh, jars of Clay, obviously referring to the fact that we, we're from the dirt. Yeah. You know what I mean? As in God formed us out of the dirt, he breathed his life into us, but we're still dirt at the end of the day. And uh, and so, you know, that, that story, I really wanted to put it in there because it, it showed my frailty. And and for those of you who haven't read the book, I'm talking about the night that I was at the football. Yeah, That was, uh, I'd only met Rio a couple of days earlier, first game of the season, Richmond versus Carlton. And and I end up in a situation where I really did embarrass myself, as in we had 40-something people there from church, and I end up standing up asking some guy to uh, step out into the car park and let's get it on. <laughs> and so it's like, what was I thinking? Well, obviously, I wasn't thinking, and I was trying to defend some kid, and, but who cares? At the end of the day, I embarrassed myself, and I had to apologize to to a whole lot of people in the process. And I praise the Lord, he didn't take me up on going downstairs. So I'm glad about that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we are all a little bit broken and we are all work in progress. And, and that's the thing I love about it. Like when that happened, obviously, I was a pa senior pastor of a yep. large church. And, and uh, I think at that time I was on the national executive. I was also a state president of our movement. And it's like, here I am getting myself into a position like that. But it goes to show that God can use anyone. You know, I think about, you know, Moses. God had a plan for Moses and Moses ended up saying, well, he went more than saying, he ended up clobbering someone. And, um, and I'd never encourage anyone to do that, but he did it. But God wasn't finished with him. As in, I'd, I'd encourage everybody. It's like, you know, we've all made mistakes along the way. We're, we've all done things that we regret. We've all had to go back and say sorry. Um, but just understand that it's a journey. It's a process. And as much as it's about what God is wanting to do through us, it's actually probably more about what God is wanting to do in us. Yeah, that's. I think I said in one of the earlier podcasts that, you know, the whole purpose of this podcast uh, isn't that necessarily we'd all be great leaders, but we'd all be made into the image of Christ. Because yeah. that's the goal, isn't it? As in, and I think sometimes we get it all mixed up, as in I think sometimes in the church at large, we put things up as this is the pinnacle. I don't know that it is. I think actually becoming like Christ is the pinnacle, which means, you know, when we have those moments, we just got to go back and put our hand up, say sorry, move on. And, uh, you know, if we need to repent, we repent. It's like, Lord, Absolutely. I remember walking in that <laughs> night. I was so embarrassed. Just that's the word. It was like, how did I get myself into that into that position? But praise God, I got myself in. God got me out. It was all okay. I, I, I really do like that the start of the book starts with that. Yeah. And I think, did you always plan to put that at the start? Um, I don't know that I always. As in, <laughs> okay. So my, my, my book writing technique, I don't know that I have a technique. It's like I just started. And I'll, I'll, I just wanted to be real and, and let people into the fact that, you know, only believe chapter one. And you, you, can look at, you can look at our world, you can look at us, you can look at individuals and think everyone has it all together. We're all, we're just work in progress. We're just, we're still on the potter's wheel and getting smacked around by God sometimes <laughs> and shaped by God. And, and then, you know, it's, uh, I think about the crucible and, uh, you know, there's so many songs that include the crucible or, or the wine press or whatever and all they all sound beautiful and we stand in worship singing them and it's like it's like it's like there's nothing joyful about getting beat up by god you know what i mean getting squashed by god the the crucible is like everything gets put in it goes into the, and the heat comes on 
and then the crud rises. Yeah. And it's like this journey, in, I think, personally, I think the reason we have 70 years, well, the Lord says, you know, three score and 10, which is 70 mm -hmm. years, sometimes 80 if we're blessed, it's, uh, is because it takes that long to be made into the image of Christ. And then God says, all right, they can come home. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon God uses ministry and marriage in both of those areas. Absolutely. For yeah. all of us that are in ministry, for all of us that are married, you know what I'm talking about. It's like uh, they are places where the Lord will do a work on us and in us. There's no doubt about that. I, I love that. Um, I had a jazz of clay moment not too long ago, <clears throat> just before uh, speaking to over 100 of our leaders for um, our next steps. Okay. The morning was horrible. I had neighbors abusing me and I had to call the police and what, and I was in the tension of, I've got to go talk to leaders now. So I've got to behave myself in this situation. And I was late to the meeting and I remembered this chapter and I got up in front of everyone and I said, I'm sorry, I'm late. This is what happened. I'm human. <laughs> There's a story that reminds me of a story when I was going to church, had Michael gone in the, in the car for a 7 a.m. prayer meeting and uh, on the way down Lance Road, um, I ended up in an altercation, the road rage going on and so I ended up pulling up beside this guy and abusing him and then I went to the prayer meeting and it's like, why am I even here? So then I had to get up, had to go next door and uh, sort of that with the people next door and the factory next door. As in that story, you need to ask about that story another day because the way that ends is hilarious. Well, hilarious. sort of, but God is good. But I love that tension that, um, yes, we're human, but the Holy Spirit is like, no, you, you messed up. Yeah. You can't continue until you make this right. You got to own it. Yeah. This is, and this is what, we're, okay, so we're going to talk about faith today. Yeah. All right. That's what it's all about. It's in only believe. It's like, yeah, only believe. It's a faith journey. But there's so many elements and parts to this journey. And we've got to be real. We've got to be real. My, my encouragement to everyone everywhere, every leader everywhere, every Christian everywhere, is be real. Be real with yourself. And, and you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to be able to look at yourself. You've got to be able to look in the mirror and see both, you know, when things are good and when things are bad. And you've got to own it, whatever that may be. And it's great to have people around you that will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Praise the Lord. We all need people that will help us along the way. At the end of every chapter, I haven't seen this in many books, um, but you have a thought to ponder. Yep. And I've put those in for, for, for us to speak today. Yep. So a thought to ponder for jars of clay. If God was only interested in engaging with perfect people, he would need to start again. Yep. But he hasn't done that for he knows his power is perfected in our weakness. Yep. And when his light and power burst forth from our weak bodies, it's then that he gets all the glory. Yeah. Yep. You speak into that? I can. I, oh, it oh. almost says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's a point. It's like God does get the glory. And it's like, and I, and I, I say it again, don't shy away from your weaknesses. Don't. Mm. And it's like, just own them and look to grow and go on the journey with God. To be honest, as I look at my life and, and Georgie's and, and ours, um, as in if, if, I, if I was God, I'm not obviously, but if I was, I wouldn't have chosen me to be part of building this thing called Enjoy Church. Mm. I would have chosen someone else because I know my flaws, I know my frailties, I know my brokenness, I know where the, the underbelly is, so to speak. And it's like, and, but so does God. But God still chooses who he yeah. chooses and he graces who he graces and he's not looking for perfect. Mm. He's looking for willing, he's looking for obedient, submitted, um, he's looking for repentant, he's looking for honest, he's looking for all those things that those characteristics that we would see in Christ and see in the champions that we love. But I don't think other than Christ, any of them are perfect. And, uh, and it should give us all hope. You read through the scriptures, That's you, see, right, you yeah. see the brokenness of them all. It's all revealed and it's all there to encourage us. If I can use these people like this, I can use you like this. And then he does get the glory. You know, you know as well as I do, you come to enjoy church and you look around our world and it's like, wow, how did this happen? And it's like, it's got to be God. Got to be God, because it's way bigger and better than anything we could ever put together. Yeah. You said that all throughout Scripture, and it's true. 
uh, all throughout Scripture, you see God using broken men, broken women. Yeah. Um, only one perfect yeah. um, person in the Bible, and that's Jesus. Yeah. So we see this, if you read our Bible from the start to the end, you start with your book, Jars of Clay, yeah. um, and, and you're vulnerable. But why in church do we have this attitude of that we need to um, be perfect or look towards man and kind of have this, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, facade. Facade? Yeah, yeah. That, would that be we good. have to be perfect yeah, because yeah. we're Christians? Yeah. I think um, that has been sold to us in the past. Mm. Uh, to be honest, I think, the, I think things are changing, though, even within the church. Um, as, as I've watched the church over the last four, five, six, ten years, whatever it may be, 20 years, we, we can see that many things that had the appearance of, mm. it, it's like everyone's like, well, I thought it was this and I thought it was that and I thought they were this and I thought they were that. And maybe it's not all it's painted to be. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think one of the things for Enjoy typically over many years, decades now, is we, we have been transparent, we have been vulnerable, we've been authentic to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we have a, a, appealed uh, appealed to so many yeah, uh, because, because people know that they're not perfect yeah. and when they hear us talking about our imperfections and our frailties and our weaknesses, they can identify with that. That's right. Yeah. They can identify with that. I think, I think, you know, being able to identify with is so important. You know, when Jesus was speaking to Thomas after he was crucified, he said, come and put your, your fingers into my hands and put your hand into my side. That's right. And he wanted um, uh, Thomas to come and identify with who he was and where he was at. And I think it's a good thing. I think... Um, I, I, I think it allows people to just have that sense of, yeah, I, I can identify with this. Because uh, then they don't feel they need to be perfect. That's right. That uh, unrealistic expectation, unreachable. Yeah, yeah it is unreachable. Yeah. It is unreachable. Now, that, now, in saying all this, what we're not saying is let's lower the bar because mm. the standard is Christ. That's right. And that's where we're aiming for. But we just don't have to have the appearance of if it's, pretending and it's like no 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 let's be real with this and just own it that's cool yeah, yeah i love it yeah so on my way um to your house today <laughs> yeah. um i was playing one of my favorite um playlists which is morning praise and ron cannoli old old school guy morning into dancing one yeah, of my yeah. favorite songs why because it has flutes all throughout it i don't know why it's got so many flutes but it's got flutes there's a chapter that I love, and I've heard bits and pieces of this all throughout, especially your altar calls. Okay. Yeah? Joy comes in the morning. Is that what I say, is it, in my altar calls? I, I, I mean, the story of yeah, this, yeah. joy comes in the morning, okay, yeah, does yeah. come through in your altar calls Okay, often. okay. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that chapter, Joy Comes in the Morning? Joy Comes in the Morning. So now I, mean, I haven't read the book for some time, so I imagine we're talking about when I got saved. Is that right? Yes, yeah, it was, a, it was a, not your typical um, experience, I would say. Yeah, so, so that, that experience for me was, um, the funny part is I can remember a lot of it like it was yesterday. Yeah. And I am so thankful to Christ. As in, you, you know my story. My parents got saved when I was a 10-year-old. I grew up in the church. I wasn't of the church. I got to a point at 21 where I started running from God, stopped going to church altogether, one step away. And sometimes, if you can hear funny noises coming through, it's the dog, all right? It's the dog. And so, snoring. Snoring, that's yeah. right. They're the funny noises. And so, um, so, so I, I, I stepped out of church altogether um, for about nine months and, and um, um, occasionally would hit the wobbler juice a little bit too hard. Yeah. And uh, as a result of that, I was at in Albury, which is where I grew up. I was at a, at a party with friends and... Um, uh, ended up in hospital and um, alcoholic poisoning. But in that place, I had an encounter with Christ, which changed my life. I woke up the next day. Uh, as I think I might have said it in the book. I had burnt lips at the time when I yeah, woke up. Yeah. And uh, the reason I had burnt lips, because I, I had to ask, why are my lips burnt? And they said, you're 
eating the, the pig on the spit, and I said, well, why do they get burnt lips? And they said, well, it's still on the spit, it was still, on the fire. still cooking on the <laughs> spit, and you are trying to eat it. <laughs> anyway, but as a result, oh, wow. when, I, when I woke up, this one is all I know. My encounter with Christ was as real when I woke up, and it is to this day, um, and it's changed my life. And so it's really quite amazing how one encounter can actually change everything. And so... You know, I, I'm so thankful. Joy did come in the morning. I was searching. I was lost. I was, and that's why I ended up in that state. I, you know, there's so many people out there that are searching and lost. My encouragement to everybody is invite your friends to church. Invite your work colleagues to church. Invite yeah. your mates to church, your brothers, your sisters, your aunties, your uncles, whoever. Invite your neighbors to church because one encounter with Christ can change not only their life, but you think about my life got changed. Mm. Georgie's got changed, our kids got changed, yours got changed. We're all, in some ways, the fruit of what happened with one encounter in an unconscious state. And it's like, I thank God for that. So joy does come in the morning. Weeping can endure. Yeah, people live lives and they, they don't do it right and they don't get it right. But then one encounter with God, that's the joy and everything changes. Yeah, it says that it was an incredible moment of clarity in the confusion of it all. Yeah, yeah. You heard a voice clear as clear as clear as day yep. and it says um that you heard uh it wasn't like anything profound it was if you die now are you coming to be with me yep. or are you going yep. down yeah and that's 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 what it was and so it, it sounds strange but um that that voice booms in my soul in my spirit to this day to this day yeah, that, wow. that that sentence it's never left I, I get it. I got it. I got it in the moment. And I, so when I, got, when I got up two days later, I got to Melbourne as quickly as I could and I was in a youth camp that weekend because I knew, that's it, I knew what I encountered. I encountered Christ. When I came back, I, I came back a Jesus freak. Mm. I went from zero to 100 mile an hour. People are like, what happened to you? And I'm like, I met the Lord, I met the Lord. And they were, they were confused. And I was a bit confused why it hadn't happened to them. Where's your joy? You know what I mean? I'm like, why aren't you as excited as I am? I met Jesus. And it's like, um, but, you know, one encounter, it's like, it's amazing, amazing. It's mm -hmm. like, they, they took me to hospital. I was in and out of consciousness. Yeah. And uh, I vomited down the side of my car, which I hated. It was like, not I'm a car pain. guy. It's not good for pain. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the vomit off the paint far out. But anyway, it's, uh, uh, but they got me to hospital. They, they, they kicked my, my mates that came in with me out. And then in that place, um, like, and I was drunk, but the volume went off. Mm. And I could think as clear as I've ever been able to think. I couldn't move anything. I'm laying there like paralyzed. And, but I can see... I can't hear, but I can think as clear as a bell. Mm. That's when the Lord said, if you die now, are you coming to be with me or are you going down? And I knew if I die now, I'm going to hell. It was, mm. that, it was that real. And then I woke up the next day. But that voice has never gone away. Mm. And that joy has never left. Even in depression, you know, mm. as like last year, obviously I was in a pretty bad way. On that couch just over there, um, I had some pretty unsavory conversations with God, yeah. but there was a joy in the madness, which was bizarre, bizarre. And it's like, that's why I say faith for me, you know, faith is a conviction of things hoped for. Um, it's a believing what you don't see. But for me, in some ways, it's, faith is really the essence of everything you actually believe. And in moments like that, and there's many moments in our life we really get to understand and know what we really believe because yeah. it's going to come out then. Yeah. You said it's such a, it still booms in your head till now, that, that experience. I, I, I think people have God encounters throughout yeah. their life, but they don't hold on to that God encounter or they forget what God has said or called yeah um and you've seen this over and over again with all yeah, the yeah. years of ministry yeah yeah um what do you think 
Why, why do you think it's not a booming, when you have a God encounter for some people, why doesn't it stay as a booming thought? Like God's yeah. called you. Like that moment, you could probably relive it right now. And I okay. see the conviction of, yeah, yeah. of the journey with ministry, with enjoy, yeah. because of that moment. Yeah. So this is, what I, this is what I would say to everybody. Okay, if we're, if we're reading the Old Testament, we're New Testament people, mm. all right? Um, uh, so we're, we're New Testament people, but we, take the, we need to look to the Old Testament and look at the principles. When you think about some of the great God moments, okay, let, let's take uh, uh, Jacob, he's on the run. Mm. We're all on the run. We were on the run, whatever. Jacob has an encounter with God. What does he do? He sets up a memorial yeah. to the moment. I think a lot of the time we move on and we forget. Yeah. I think there's, it's really good to remember, to really remember. Yeah, that's cool. And like all the way through the Old Testament, they would set stones up as memorials and reminders. So, they, so, it, so later when they're coming back, they remember what happened here. Yeah. You've got to remember what happened. For me, I, I can't leave what happened. And throughout the book, there's moments and there's stories of scenarios and situations. And, and I never want to forget because we, we build line upon line. That, that's how we build anything in Christ. And our faith journey is one that's meant to be built line upon line. Mm. And in every line, God's got something there for us. In every, in every occasion, in every season, where, where are the God moments? Now, I'm not going to tell you that I've got like... Um, Every day of my life, I've had a God moment. I haven't. Yeah. But, but along the way, there have been significant moments where we have seen the wonder, the power, the joy, yeah. the miraculous of God, and God has turned up. I never want to forget. Yeah. I never want to forget. I think we need to be very deliberate. Now, you know me by nature. I'm a romantic. As in, I'm just wired like that. I, and, uh, you know, Georgie loves it and hates it probably at times because, like, <laughs> it's like, oh, remember when we heard that song? And it's like, it's like she's like, what song? And it's like, where, 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 where? <laughs> it's our song. <laughs> it's our song. It's like, you forgot our song. But it's like, but I'm wired to remember kindness and goodness. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so when it comes to God, I don't want to forget, you know, when it comes to the kindness that I've received from the church, I don't want to forget yeah. when it comes to the kindness I've received from friends. I don't want to forget because it's significant. Mm. The kindness of God, the goodness of God, layer upon layer. Can I ask practically, what do those memorial moments look like for you? Is it just you've got a good memory and you remember them or is, does it go beyond that? No, no. I, I would say at large, I, I just remember them. Yeah. But, I, but you were talking about, was it the, jour the journeyman? Yeah. yeah, so like you said... The high women. High women. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're storytellers. They're storytellers. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, some of the, the cultures, Cambodians are story storytellers. Yeah. They tell stories. I think it's good, you know, it's like, um, you know, when, when you're raising your children, we're to, we're to sit, we're to walk down the, the road and tell stories. We sit around the yeah. table and tell stories. I, I think it's great for parents. I think it's great for pastors. I think it's great for leaders. I think it's great for the soul to actually just take the time and remember, tell the story, tell yeah. the story, you know. And we could tell, you know, <laughs> in the enjoy story, how many stories are there, Christian? You know, as well as I do. Too many to count. Too many to count. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the things I love about this book, tell some of them. Mm. doesn't tell all of them. I don't think this book talks about, you know, <laughs> driving around in the middle of the night. I don't think it tells the story. When, uh, when we're stepping into the northern suburbs of Melbourne and eating kebabs at 1 a.m. in the morning and <laughs> believing that God was going to do something. And, the, and then the family that we connected to up there through uh, Vivian and Louise, yeah. and because they saw my faith as I drove, not only in the western suburbs, but then drove to the eastern suburbs. They're like, we can do that too. So then they drove up there and they got connected too. And, but that family up there that owned the building that we're in in the north, that, that's just a miracle story. It's just like, it's like I've lost my father recently, and I I, I'm getting I'm getting messages from that family regularly, just encouraging me and saying they're praying for me. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. And it's so, but there's there's a hundred stories. There's a thousand stories. I don't know, yeah. but we don't remember them all. But there's significant ones, and from there you can build. It's like steps of faith, 
and you can just sit around the fire out the back and talk about maybe we should do that one day yeah, and just can... talk about all the different things that have occurred. Yeah. It'd be awesome. That'd be a great podcast, what do you reckon? That would be a great yeah, podcast. Yeah. As in, because you could get a couple of others in that have been on the journey and like we've we've all got we've all got memories that are so fond of us all. And yeah. but 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 once again, it's the goodness of God. Yeah. And if God was good to the Israelites and God was good to the early church and God has been good so far, I think we've been singing a song, we'll see it again. Yeah, we'll see You'll it again. do it again, Lord. You'll yeah. do it again. And he will. Yeah. He will if we continue to step by faith. Once we stop stepping, he'll go find someone else to step with. That's cool. So for you, those memorial moments are you being very purposeful in telling those stories and being thankful to God and yep. thankful to people yep. constantly. Yep. yep. That's really cool. Yeah, yep. I like that. You've got to keep going and you've got, you've got to remain thankful. Stuff happens. <laughs> stuff happens. <laughs> what are you going to focus on? The stuff of the goodness of God. Yeah. And, and a lot of the goodness of God that I've received, most of it, a lot of it has come through people. Yeah. Yeah. I look at who I'm surrounded by. I love it. It's goodness of God. That's really cool. A thought to ponder from this chapter. Yep. Many of us have family, friends, situations, and dreams that we have been believing in and praying for. Keep going. Keep praying. Don't quit. Yep. God is at work. He will reward you in due time if you don't give up. Yep. I'm so thankful for the pray praying parents. Oh, aren't we all? Yeah. And friends who stepped in and used their faith for me when I didn't have a faith of my own. Yep. Yep. When I was um when I was out running around for that nine months, there was a couple of guys from the church that I had been involved in um, that met every Thursday morning at six a.m. and they would pray for me like clockwork. Yeah. Wow. And I knew it. <laughs> you feel it. <laughs> yeah. As in, and one of them told me, we meet and we pray for you every week. And I'm like, keep on praying. And they did. <laughs> and then God got me. And uh, uh, I'm just so thankful. It wasn't long after that, one of those brothers went to be with Jesus at the age of 42. Oh, wow. Crazy, eh? Mm. Crazy, crazy. And uh, But when I, when I came to Christ, he was so thankful. When I, when I went and visited him in hospital before he passed, he was just so thankful. Yeah, I'm thankful for them. So keep on praying. If you're a parent and you don't have children in church, pray for your kids. Don't yeah. give up. Yeah. Don't give up. Keep loving them. Stop preaching to them. <laughs> <laughs> They've heard it all before. Yeah. And um, be a good example. Love them. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Keep praying. It. There's a chapter that's called, it's not chronological in order, but it's called A Walk of Faith. And you yep. tell the story it's a pretty crazy story. I don't know if this is the way I would have done it, but you sell your house, <laughs> you pack the removalist truck, yep. and when the truck driver asks you where you're taking your belongings to, you said you didn't know. <laughs> and it says that he looked at you like you were crazy. Yeah, and I think he said something pretty similar. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's probably the first time he's encountered that. I reckon it was. I reckon it was, yep. Tell us a bit about that story. Well, that story it was all about us moving to Albury. George and I had been yep. married a year and um, probably closer by that time, just over a year. And um, we really felt the Lord was leading us to Albury. I grew up in Albury. I'd been in Melbourne at that stage, went back when I was 17. So uh, uh, eight years back in Melbourne. Yep. I had no desire to move back to Albury. Um, and, um, but one weekend, George and I went to Albury and we just really felt to move to Albury and to, uh, obviously we were, you know, we we're in a good church in Melbourne and, but we felt to go to this very small church. And, uh, um, and so we put the house on the market and it sold like that. And, um, and away we went, but the problem was we didn't have a house to move into. And, um, and so we had our removalist booked and he came around, we, we loaded up the truck on a Sunday and um, he closed the door and he goes, can I have the address? And I said, um, no. <laughs> and then you feel a bit stupid in that moment. There's no doubt about that. And he's like, I can't have an address. And I said, no, we don't have an address. 
And I said, but here's hoping and praying by the time we get to Walbury, we have an address. And so uh, we all went up the freeway together and, and George and I would continue to pull in along the way and uh, make phone calls to uh, different people. Uh, we'd been trying to get, but we got knocked back, knocked back, knocked back. But the people that knocked us back in the end gave us a, a house. So when we got to Walbury, we had an address. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend everyone do that, by the way. Um, but, you know, once again, it's like you, you, can, you can see what people believe by the way they live their life. Yeah. And like I say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend anyone do it that way. But we were committed to going. We believed it was the Lord. We had a word from God. We stepped out on the water and God held us up. And so, um, you know, that, that, would be, that would be one of the, uh, one of the monuments, just put it in the ground. It's like when God tells you to go, you go. You know, when God turned up to Abram and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you from your father's house and, mm -hmm. and it's like, I'm going to take you to a land that you do not know. Um, it's like, it, it, sometimes these things don't make a lot of sense. Don't make a lot of sense. And they don't necessarily make a whole lot of sense to the people around you either. Um, one of the things I'm thankful for is at Enjoy Church, we've been here now coming up to 26 years. Mm -hmm. And I've probably only said to our vision team and board or, and church six or seven times in that whole time, God said. Every time, though, I've said God said, God has come through. Yeah. We've seen God move. So, um, you know, I, I basically, I can stand before the vision team and board and say, God said, and they'll follow me wherever. But I, have, I don't have a track record of saying God said and then sinking to the bottom of the sea. Yeah. Uh, typically, if I say God said, we walk on the water. And we've done that over and over and over over the years. And so, um, but, I'm, but I would, what I would say to everybody is be very careful what you say God said to and then have the right people in your life to, uh, to go on that journey with you. Yeah. yeah. So, so that, that story yeah. was early on. Yeah. Um, you and Pastor George, you were married for how long at that uh, stage? At that point in time, just over a year. Just over, so newlyweds. Yeah. Um, you probably didn't have all these memorial stones to go, yep, yeah, no. God's come through, God's come through. No. Um, I know in hindsight when you read it, you're like, of course God had us. Yeah, yeah. How were you feeling though oh, when, in that moment? Well, I was there an overwhelming sense of confidence or was, was, were you like... No, no. It's Worried like, and fearful and yeah, and this is, this, this is interesting, isn't it? So, okay, David's running at Goliath. I reckon he's confident, but maybe, just maybe peeing his pants a little bit. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? I think I just did. It's like, it's like, it's like, for me, a walk of faith isn't an absence of fear. Yeah, that's good. But a walk of faith is a walk of faith. And you walk it in the sunlight, you can walk it in the rain. You can walk it in the moonlight, you can walk it in the pain. Oh, that'll rhyme. You can walk it any time. But faith isn't the absence of fear. Faith isn't the absence of giants. Mm. Faith isn't the absence of sickness. When I was on the couch last year, mm. man, I'd never been in a space or a place like that. Yeah. But it didn't change my faith. It didn't change my faith, not for a moment. My faith was still in Christ, as in, um, but that's a faith walk. So when the, when the door got shut, I knew what he was going to ask next because he'd already said earlier in the day, I need to get the address off you. Yeah. And like now that the, the doors get shut, I know and I feel like I'm feeling dumb mm. because I don't have an address, but I feel God's, God's got us. Yeah. Um, I hope God has got us. <laughs> there you go. I hope. <laughs> I hope. Convictions of things hoped for. That's what faith is. Yeah. You've got to convict. I'm hoping. Um, sometimes, though, I think, though, people mistake just natural hope for faith. Mm. They're hoping, they're wanting, they're desiring, and they put it in the faith. There's been many things I've hoped for, wanted, desired, but they're not part of my faith journey mm. because it's at a natural level rather than a spiritual level. Mm. But when you hear God's voice, mm. you've got to get out of the boat. The miracle won't occur until you put your foot outside the boat. Yeah. So you, you mentioned there that, which is hearing God's voice and, yeah. and having a conviction and then sometimes the, the, the natural hope. 
Yeah. How do you tell the difference? That's a great question. I wish I had a very, an answer that would be uh, adequate. You just got to, you got to know it in your knower. You got you, you have to have heard from God. So, so, okay. So w the night that I drove out to uh, Melton, yep. 2 a.m. in the morning, I'm bouncing up and down on the bed saying, Georgie, get out of bed. Let's go to Melton. She's like, what's the matter with you? And I'm not going anywhere. So I said, all right, I'll see you later. As in, I drove out, but it wasn't a natural hope. Oh, I hope we can play in church in Melton one day. There's all, I, I hope for many things, mm. but there's a hope that's connected to, a, to something in, in here. The, the conviction Maybe that's the word that we need to join that hope to. Is there a conviction mm. that is beyond the natural? I, I, mean, I have a conviction that this is going to happen. Um, I can't see it. When I went out there, it was the middle of the night, but I knew it was going to happen. Mm. And that, that is still on social media to this day. It's still yeah. there, yeah. still sitting there. In fact, I, I put it up again recently as we were talking about some of the things that are that God has done for us. Yeah, we've got it on ready to play because there's yeah. so many new people coming yeah. to enjoy and they don't know yeah. that part of our history. Yeah. It's a pretty cool clip. That's right. So I think sometimes, you know, because like, okay, we've got multi site, we've got all these locations everywhere. And I think some people think we all sit in the boardroom together with a big map saying, okay, strategically, how do, where are we going to, how are we going to do this to take over the world for Jesus or whatever? It doesn't work like that. It, it works in the middle of the night when God speaks. When God speaks. That's, that's how it works for me. And that's how it's always worked for me. And it's like, there's a word, there's a something. And it's like, it began when we went east. I had no desire to plant another, a, a second location. No desire at all. When Mark Connor said, would you ever plant a second location? I said, I can't do one right. Why would I try to do two? And I was serious. It's like, I'm just trying to work this thing out. Yeah. But then um, two years later, when we've got people traveling from um, over in Officer and Berwick and those places, it's like, it just, uh, and I said, I asked the question, how are we gonna look after these people like that? Mark Connor's voice came back to me. It was like, would you ever do two? And I'm like, that's the answer. Yeah. And then that's when we started to step it out. So the stepping out for me, and I get asked all the time, where are the places you have in mind for the future? Unless God is speaking to me uh, or speaking to someone, um, I, I don't have any other places. I never had the second place. So, yeah, we just we follow the leading of God to the best of our ability. Yeah. Cool. And, and sometimes we get it wrong. Mm. Let's just be honest. Sometimes we get it wrong. But I, I'd rather get it wrong occasionally than uh, never make a mistake because <laughs> I never had the courage to step out at all. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Back, going back to that, that drive with Pastor Georgie. Yeah, yeah. What were her thoughts? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. She was the one that was making all the calls and, uh, as we drove along. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know what her thoughts were, as in I just thank God along the way that I've had a wife that was prepared to follow and go on the journey. Yeah. Um, you know, George and I have been talking lots in the, in the last year or two just about life in general and, you know, even from, from our formative years, our childhood coming through and... and um, but I just thank God that Georgie was always prepared to say, yeah, let's go. Um, and, you know, I would uh, I'd say that's typically the way it is. Um, what I would also say is any husband that doesn't listen to his wife when his wife is... Um, so, so for me, yeah. for me, Georgie is very much a faith girl and let's go. But if she's ever said, we need to slow this down, we need to think about yeah. this... We need to watch that person. We need to watch this situation. I'm all ears. Yeah. Yeah. That's I'm really all cool. ears because over the years, really has she been wrong? Yeah. Mm. So. Some wisdom right there. Uh, there is some mm -hmm. wisdom right there. And I would say, you know, in, in many marriages, um, it, it is often the, the, the husband that is leading um, and then we go together. Um, but in some marriages, it's the other way around. So if it's the other way around in your marriage, it's fine. Just make sure if, if you're a wife that you're listening to your husband if he's being cautious in scenarios and moments. Yeah. Uh, as you were telling the story of that, 
you know, Melton, initially this, going back to Albury, it came, came to mind something that you always say, what's the last thing God has told you or asked you and have you done it? Yeah, yeah. Is that something that you early on um, obviously practiced and you keep saying it? Like, um, no. Nah. What's, 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 for even practically, what's, what's a, a, a good time limit? Like, have I done it right now or am I looking to do it? Am I planning? Yeah. If well, God's asked you to do something or, or yeah. head to a new location. Yeah. So it depends what it is. Yeah. Depends what it is. I think um, and what I'm about to say is going to be controversial. All right. So uh, let's I just, like it. I like it. Here we go. Uh, no, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying for controversial sake, but I, I mm. think, you know, one of the great things of being around now, the length of time that I have, mm. there, there is actually, thank you, Piper, there is actually a, a great wins in getting old. And, and it's like, really? And it's like, I'm not saying I'm old, not as old as some, but I'm getting older. There's no doubt about that. But you get to see what happens over time. Yeah. And you get to watch stories play out. Yeah. And so, um, so one, of the, one of the great things about getting older is the reality. You get, you get to see decades of faith journeys playing mm. out. Mm. Uh, to be honest, when it comes to the issue of faith, and when it comes to the issue of hearing from God, I, I don't necessarily buy into it all. What do I mean by that? Like, we all know people that, that hear from God every day about everything. And you've met them and they're wearing this tie and they're like, God told me to put this tie on today. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so because that's an ugly tie. And maybe God did tell you to wear the tie. I don't know. There's a whole lot of stuff that I don't know about. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a lot of journeying that I don't know about. Um, there's a lot to do with faith that I don't know about. I'm not going to sit here and say I've got this thing worked out because I, I, I don't. I only know in part. So we hear from God. What is the right amount of time? To a, it depends what it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if I'm in a cafe and I feel the Lord has told me to invite someone and I don't, I miss the moment. If yeah. I'm talking about another location, that's going to take time. That's right. Yeah. So. I, I think it's, uh, once again, it's acknowledging what God has said and then what am I going to do with it? How, how do I step it out? Peter heard the Lord and his moment was now. Um, uh, it's, not always, it's not always like that in the moment. Sometimes it's in the moment. Sometimes you've got to, got to step it out. But, but as we journey, as in I meet a lot of frustrated Christians mm. and then that question for me, is very appropriate. Yeah. Okay, you're frustrated. God's not opening the doors. God's not leading you on like you thought he would. What was the last thing God told you to do? And have you done it? Yeah. And often the answer is no. Often the answer is no. Yeah. In that space that you just mentioned, you've heard God say, go there. We're talking about locations or planting. Yep. Um, have the doors always been open? And has it been smooth sailing? No. Yeah. No. Sometimes yes. Sometimes, Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Yeah. And it's like um, God saying to do something doesn't mean it will be smooth sailing. Okay. It's like you only need to read the, the New Testament. Read the book of Acts. Did God call? Did God say yes? Did it all go smoothly? No. As in, why am I in jail singing, <laughs> singing worship songs in the middle of the night? If God was in this whole thing, well, God is in the whole thing. And it's like, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that because God has said something, there won't be resistance. We shouldn't think that because God has said something, it's going to be open doors. Um, uh, let's pray that there are open doors. Let's pray all the giants fall down. Let's pray that there is no uh, resistance. But just because there's resistance and it's, it's, it's a struggle, it, most things, as they're being birthed, there will be a struggle and often blood. Welcome to church. <laughs> Welcome to leadership. Welcome to ministry. As in any, 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 anything that's worth having yeah. uh, and birthing. As in typically there's a, a point of conception and then there's a period of time yeah. and then there's a birthing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a journey like that in our walk with God as well. This is the faith journey. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's the struggle. It's the resistance that makes us stronger in our faith. Yeah. Then when we see God come through, God gets all the glory. 
And uh, we all say, yeah, look what we've done. Not really, Not because really. if we do, we're in trouble. Yep. But, you know, the reality is like, as in we struggle, God brings a breakthrough. Yeah. The East story reminds me of that. Yeah. The East story and finding a building oh, and finding a building over trying there. to navigate moving out of the, the old building and yep. trying to go into a new building. And, you, and in hindsight, you can look back and you see the goodness of God through it all. In hindsight. In the moment, I was pulling my <laughs> hair out saying... Whatever. But the same thing happened at Melton, eh? Hey? Yeah. Like we're in COVID. I'm getting photos sent to me of that building being built and I'm, and I'm getting the photos and I'm saying to Georgie, I'm going to jail. I'm <laughs> going to go to jail because we're building a, a building to, that we're going to lease. and No one can leave home. We can't even leave our house. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, we all saw God come through. And look what God has done in Melton. Oh, look, what God, look at that building there in the east. That East Building is nothing short of a miracle. It is a miracle. So we sell it. It takes two and a half years to find another building. Yeah. Um, what I love, you know, Paul Polygra heard about that building at a at a real estate breakup the year before. Calls us five months later, five months because he realised in the when he heard about it, he thought, "I need to tell Enjoy about this building." <laughs> it didn't exactly suit all our needs, but. Yada yada. So, but it took five months for the call to come he, through. He forgot. We, he, 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 I don't know what <laughs> happened. Know. But this one thing I know: after five months, when we put in a low ball offer, they were more than willing to accept it because nobody else offered anything. Yeah. Can you imagine if we had a went there at Christmas time? Mm. That's like five months down the track. Our bargaining uh, power <laughs> changed altogether. Praise and that Lord. building now, I would say that's the best building in Joy Church has. It certainly is. Yeah, Every I, time I see it, I I'm like, I, I love that envy. building. No, yeah. I'm not envious, but yeah. I'm very happy for them. I like our car park in the West End. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there's some beautiful things. Like, look at the building in Hobart. Yeah. Look at, look at that story. All right, so it's a faith story. <laughs> All right, so I get it in my heart to do something in Hobart. I go to Hobart. I walk the streets. Walk the streets. How is God going to do this? Oh, man. Other than meeting John Cleese on that trip, nothing good happened. <laughs> nothing good happened. I walked up and said, are you John Cleese? He goes, I am. Anyway, you know the story. And it's like, so, but other than meeting John Cleese, I, I felt like a guy with a Rubik's Cube. Try, now, I'm not a good Rubik's Cube person, yeah. but, I, but I felt like that, and I really felt the Lord just say, put it down. Four years later, out of the blue, we get the call. Uh, from a, a wonderful couple hmm. that we barely know and they want to give us their church. And it's like, that facility is amazing. It is, yeah. Look what the Lord has done. Now look at them down there. Uh, the Fithians are going off. There's so many stories like this. Um, they just go on. Um, I love the thought to ponder for this chapter. A miracle will never occur as long as your commitment to the comfort of the boat is greater than your desire to obey his voice yep. but the moment your foot hits the water as you follow his lead it's then that the miracle occurs yeah and that's the story over and over again yeah it's interesting thought hey when when did the actual miracle occur you reckon mm. because like in for peter and his reality it happened when the foot hit the water but maybe in Heaven's reality, the Lord's reality, was when he said, tell me to come. Ah, yes. Maybe. I like that. And this is where, that's what I say, we only ever know in part in all of this. And there's God's point of view and there's our point of view. Mm. For Peter, it was when it put it in water. But maybe in, for Peter, it was as real as real when he said, tell me to come, and he heard God speak. Maybe in hearing God speak, for Peter, the miracle had occurred. Yeah. I don't know. And it's a miracle about what's happening in us or what's happening in the, like, in reality, in essence. Because that water had to turn to something. Yeah. Completely changed the nature of physics right physics. there. Physics, yeah. It's, it's crazy. I love it. Yeah. And this is why ne ne never, never try to work out how God can do something. Mm, put him in a box. Don't put him in the box because yeah. he'll blow your box up. Yeah. And if you, if you try to work out how he's going to do it, typically it won't work like that. Because he's like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm God, not you. Uh, speaking of things that don't make sense, you know, we talked about changing physics and it's not logical. There's a chapter in the book, We Will Reap What We Sow. And this story does seem to go against logic. Can you 
recall the story, tell us a little bit about it, give us context, and then why it's so illogical. Okay, so the story I think we're referring to is when we turned up um, in Melbourne, uh, we were sent out uh, by Morwell and mm -hmm. uh, Mark and Karen, and so they sent us to take on Killer Assembly of God. Killer Assembly of God had been through um, a crazy time. We'll just say that, a crazy time. They had had lots of pastors in a very short period of time. They had um, a church that had disintegrated. When we got there, uh, the previous Sunday to us arriving in church, there was 22 people in church. Yeah. Then our first Sunday, there was 48, you know, the story. The revival about, right there. Yeah, oh, that's right. <laughs> I went to work. I got every name out of that filing cabinet I could find. Uh, Hello, my name is Shane Spaxterius. And uh, <laughs> made the call and tried to get as many people in as we could. And, and so we had 48 people. So we were meeting at that time in the Killer Downs Community Centre. And uh, 48 people, first service. And then we had a second service, et cetera. And so, but then out of nowhere, I get a phone call from someone who was part of the church, who, who had been involved in this crazy merger, and they were saying that, well, the, the, the lease on that Sunday building was theirs, and so was a lot of the, uh, the resource that we're using for Sunday services. And, like and equipment so, and so, so yeah, yeah, equipment. And so, so long story short, I uh, had, a, had a meeting with them, and I'd found out exactly where it was all at. I don't necessarily want to go into too deep into the the, the nitty gritty of it because I certainly don't want to diss anybody. That's not the, the point of this. Yeah. But but we had our backs against the wall. We've taken on a church that's already a mess at that point in time, we, and we're looking to rebuild. And they're wanting a lot of the equipment, and they want the building and and whatever. So I am I, um, I went and organize another building for us to meet in, which was a Killer Downs Primary School. Mm -hmm. So I already had that signed off before I went into this meeting. And then we had the conversation. There was two of us on this side of the table, two of them on that side of the table. And I, I, I said, okay, so you've asked for all of this equipment and it was all there. And, and then so they, they, they were saying it was well and truly theirs, but then I pulled out all the documentation where they'd signed it all over and had given it to Killer Assembly of God. And, and uh, it was an interesting moment in the meeting. And I said, but you know what? I said, it's all good. Let's, let's load up all that equipment. And uh, Peter Scipulianus, who's still part of our world, yeah. uh, very much part of our world, great friend on the board at that point in time, we loaded up their cars and we sent them away with blessing. And it doesn't make sense in the natural, but you know what? I honestly believe, I honestly believe that that was the seed that was sown right at the beginning from which we have not just ripped equipment, mm. but facilities and buildings and people and and whatever. And I would encourage everybody in you, as you go on your faith journey. Remember, you will sow what you reap. If, if mm. you are if you are mean, you're going to reap meanness. If you are a schmuck, you're going to reap schmuckiness. Mm. If you are tight, you're going to reap tight. Mm. If you are generous, you will reap generosity yeah that's cool if you are kind you will reap kindness so just to be clear those documents yeah. stated in the minutes that they weren't entitled to that they had given everything to yep. heal or assemblies of god yep. and even though you had every right yep. to say it's clear as day here it's not yours yep. you still gave it all to them yeah yeah well yeah and so if and if you're asking why or how or I don't know, Christian. You know, I think, um, you know, we're all a little bit like toothpaste. When the squeeze comes on, you get to find out what's on the inside. And it's an old, it's an old saying. It's first I've heard that one, I like it. Is that right? But it's true, isn't it? As in, you don't know what's on the inside until the squeeze comes on. Mm -hmm. And when we're under pressure, you do find out what's on the inside. I, I, we had every right, mm. um, I had every right, we had every right to say, this is your signature take a hike but, but I don't know that telling people to take a hike generally wins in the kingdom of God and I don't necessarily know that the spirit of that Christ would have us be operating in I'm not saying we need to um, be walked all over and I'm not saying that you know we I, I just think there's a way to do life that honors the Lord and you know I hope as a church and I hope as leadership and I hope as leaders I hope me personally I I always show respect, honour, and dignity to everybody. Mm. 
whether they show it or they deserve it or not. I hope that that would be the general way I would treat everybody. Yeah. And over the years, I, I think it has served me very, very well. Yeah, and I think it served us very well. Just be, just treat people with honour and respect and dignity. And like, yeah, that's your signature, but we'll help you load it up. As in, his board member was crying. Oh wow. Yeah, it was a, it was a really interesting moment when I put the paperwork on the table, and his board member realised we're here trying to get something back that it's not ours. But we gave it all to him. Yeah. I love that because you said that was a seed of generosity. Yeah. And what comes to mind is if we're talking about miracles and, yeah. and the fruit of generosity, our, our Bendigo building. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us that. I know that's not part of the, yeah. the, the book, but it just came to mind right then. Yeah, and that's a, that's, I think that's a miracle. Oh, it is a miracle. And once again, it's another story, isn't it? So we've been in Bendigo, what, 10 years? I'm not too sure. Eight years, nine years. No, probably we've been over 10 years now, I'm sure, yeah. up there. And, um, and I'd forgotten. You know, this is the thing. You go on a journey and we're it's living by faith and whatever. So I'd forgotten that years ago, um, I'd, I'd called in to see a, a beautiful couple up there, um, David and Helen, and they were just stepped out and planted the church. This is going back, I don't know how many years, 20 years ago, I'm not too sure. And um, uh, 18 years ago, I'm not too sure how long ago it was, whatever it is. And so they'd stepped out and planted the church. I met with them, had coffee with them. I asked them, because they were telling me what's in their heart. I said, do you have a building, off, uh, do you have a, a building account? And they said, no. And I said, well, if you open an account, I'll give you some money. I won't mm -hmm. use sums here. I'll give you money. And it was thousands to put in your account to get it going. And, um, and we sowed that, moved on, never thought anything more of it. A number of years ago, uh, uh, Rowan and Asher leading Bendigo by then. And Rowan calls me and says, Pastor Shane, I just had this really strange conversation and I don't know how these things work, but I've got a feeling there's something happening mm. in regard to that church, those pastors and that building. Well, long story short, in the end, that building was signed over. So from that account, they bought a building right in the middle of the town and then they have become part of Enjoy Church in Bendigo. And so the building, so we stepped out of our lease building, which we needed to, into this building right in the centre of town. And once again, to God be the glory. And it's like, we sowed with no expectation. That's right. I, yeah. I was sowing into someone else's field. Yeah. Yeah. But in the end, I reaped the harvest from the field. It's like, and this is where, once, don't try and work God out. Don't try and work it all out. But... Understand what you sow is what you reap. It's a great story. I forgot about that one. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, in the moment. A thought to ponder from this, and I won't read all of it because it's, yeah. it's, it's a lengthy one, but as you journey through life with family and ministry, business and marketplace or wherever you are, your values and beliefs, beliefs will surely be tested. Yeah. What will matter in these moments isn't actually being right, but being righteous. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, personally, I love this thought yeah. because I've been around long enough to know and I've worked with many leaders. I would say some of them have been great. Some of them have been below par. And this one thing I know about leaders that are below par, they're always right. doesn't matter what you're talking about. It can be in the middle of the night, they can say the sun's shining and they're right. And it's like, that's, that's, for, me, that, for me as a leader... I understand I'm not going to be right all the time. And I understand sometimes even when I am right, if I humble myself, I can actually help people. So being right isn't really, at the end of the day, where it's at. Being like Christ is where it's at. Mm. And it's like, but so often I watch leaders and people, they'll fight to be right. I have to be right. This is what I would say, all right? So this is what I'd say. Never be, now I've said this here before, mm -hmm. you never want to be the smartest man or woman at every table. Mm. You never want to be the smartest man, woman in every room. I thank God I'm surrounded by men and women that in areas are smarter than I am. I say in areas because that's the point, isn't it? Mm. We all have something to cr contribute and we all have our strengths. But I surround myself with people who know what I don't know. I don't need to be right all the time. 
But even when I am right and I know I'm right, if it's going to help other people, I don't need to, I'm right. I want to help other people. Yeah. So maybe let that fall to the ground and just be a blessing. Yeah, but... Yeah, we don't want to be right all the time. Yeah, it's like you often say, major on what matters most. That's right. Like, you need to know what matters most before you can That's right. major in it. That's right. I'll watch people picking fights over stupid <laughs> things. Oh, my goodness. It's like, is that really important today? Yeah. No. Was it ever important? No. Why, why are you fighting about that? Let it go. Does that come with, with wisdom and age? Because um, yeah. I feel like when I was young, I would, I would go after everything. Yeah. <laughs> Did it work for you? Yeah, I learned. Yeah. So you got to... You I mean, not in a bad way, like picking fights, but yeah. I have a sense of, of, um, of what, what's right and what's wrong. I remember even as a kid, when, when someone accused me, I was in grade three of something I didn't do, I just went, no, I'm not having this. So it's like a, a sense of... Um, what's the word? Justification. Yeah, well... Where you try and justify... That's or right. Vindication. Not vindication so much, but um, I can't think of the word, guys. It's another stop. Huh? Justice. Yeah, justice. Just a sense of justice. Like, if, if, if there's something or someone, someone's doing something to someone, oh, I've got to stand up for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I understand that. And that's got me into trouble. Mm. As in, you know, I talk about in the book about having to get off the national exec, state exec. I, I was done. And the reason I was done is because I had too much blood in my sword. It says that in there. Yeah. Because I would all the time, if I thought something was unjust, I would go to war for it. Yeah. Did it do me any good? Not in the end. Um, did I win a lot of friends? Yeah. Did I make a lot of enemies? <laughs> I made one or two. <laughs> Balanced but, out. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's like, it's like I ended up, it's like just too much blood because I was all the time fighting for... Not just for what mattered to me, but for others. Yeah, yeah. And and that's not a diss on anything that happened in our in our movement or anything. It's just I have a very black and white point of view when it comes to what is just and what is righteous and what is. So I want to try and stay in those lines. Well, I don't necessarily get it right all the time though. And this is where you can end up spending a whole lot of energy on things that really don't matter. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it doesn't change a thing. Yeah. Or even if you win, sometimes. The, 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 it's a bitter taste in your mouth that I won, but why does it taste mm. so bad? What do they have to do to win? Mm. Well, I was right. Who cares? I feel... <laughs> yep. Yep. Part of um, the growth of, of Enjoy yep. has been um, the, the sense of weight you put on everyone to be custodians of culture. Yep. And there's a, there's a chapter in there that is titled Culture is King. Yep. Um, tell us about that. Yep. So the, the Culture is King chapter, I really need to give a big shout out to Sue um, and to Ruth. Yep. And so, and the reason I need to give them a, a big shout out is because that chapter was never in the book. Okay. They both read it as they were doing the editing and getting it ready. And they said, there's a chapter missing. And I'm like, what chapter is that? And they both talked about, what is it about Enjoy that makes Enjoy Church Enjoy Church? And I said, I don't want to do that chapter. And uh, I think I said that to Sue first, and then Ruth chimes in. Is in it's like it's like Siri. Why does Siri have to be a woman's voice? You know what I mean? It's like it's, it's, <laughs> I think you could change it. Can you? Siri's so. all the time telling me what to do these days, and it's <laughs> like now I'm not going to say I'm looking into the camera like I'm smiling as I'm saying it, but it's like I had a mum that used to tell me what to do. I got a wife. I got sisters. I got daughters. I got granddaughters. So oh, no, no, no. <laughs> now I got anyway. I got Sue and I got Ruth telling me what to do. It's all good. Whatever. Now Siri, Siri doesn't stop. I'm like Siri, will you please be quiet? Moving right along. So they're telling me it needs another chapter, and I'm like I don't want to do that chapter. And there's another chapter. Okay. All right. Let me think about it. I got to tell you. So Daniel Chocker asked me if I was excited about the book when it was finished because it was finished without that chapter. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, not really. I said, at the end of the day, it's just a tool for me to communicate and help people yeah. on, in this journey. And so but after that chapter went in, excitement came. Yeah, well. Because that chapter and this concept, culture is king, is central to who Enjoy Church is. Um, why do people love Enjoy Church? 
because we have a very strong culture. Why typically do people leave in Joy Church? Because we have a very strong culture. And I'm good with it all. I'm good with it all. Because I know who we are in Christ. Mm. I know what we value. I know our revelation of him and the kingdom of God. And that is why, you know, for me, I would say this to every person that is in leadership. If you're a Christian, you're in leadership. It's that simple. Mm. But every person, if, you, if you're leading in within the church space or in the um, um, uh, out there in the marketplace, yeah. wherever you may be, if you're leading at, down at the local football club, if you're leading the under 12s or whatever, understand the importance of culture. And, and culture, if you can set a healthy culture, all of a sudden the load becomes way easier. The burden becomes way easier. For us, we are the kingdom of God. That's it. All right. How awesome is this place? Genesis 28, 17. How awesome is this place? There's none other than the kingdom of God. And it's like, it's like this place is the house of God. And so it needs to reflect the culture of the kingdom. Yeah, that's cool. And so with that in mind, obviously, in all of our values, in all of our statements, they're, they're all about setting culture. And so we very much teach about it on the way in. We try to example it. And then when it's challenged, we have conversations. And most of the time, those conversations go well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to read the whole thought to ponder for culture is king because I think it's, it's amazing. It's, it's key. How can we tell if we're winning the culture war in our immediate space? So this goes beyond just church, like every space. Yeah. I believe that we'll know we're establishing our culture when it's strong enough to be replicated. For culture to be replicated, it must be definable, teachable, transferable, and able to be imparted. Always remember that when Moses prayed for his leaders, the spirit that was upon him came upon them. As such, one of my greatest joys has been to watch these spiritual sons and daughters who have been with us for many years move to different states and nations and reproduce the culture of enjoy church wherever God has called them to. Yeah. And it says there that you love it. Yeah, I do love it. <laughs> I do love it. My greatest joy these days is seeing all of you do so well. That's my greatest joy. And it's like, really? It's your greatest joy? It's like, yeah. Because uh, inherently within us as human beings, we were created in the image of God. And even within God, there is a father and a son. You hear God say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Like when he sees his son doing well, he's like, yes. For me, it's exactly the same. When, when the sons and daughters of enjoy, that have lent in, that abide in the vision, as it were, that abide in the values, abide in the culture, abide in the mm -hmm. kingdom, abide in, in what we're doing together. You know, I get to work with you, but this isn't work for me. This is life. Mm -hmm. And it's like... We're, and I think it's really interesting that what was upon Moses came upon, the same spirit that was yeah. upon Moses came upon his 70 leaders. And it's like, it's like, it's really interesting because if typically if we were working for uh, Xerox or we were working for Qantas or whatever the case may be, um, typically it's, it's about processes, it's about the policies and the mm -hmm. procedures and, and values, but it's not the same. I, I, was, I was playing uh, golf with Gary Lisbon and one of his friends um, on a very good golf course in Melbourne. And um, I, I hadn't met this guy before. And he leads one of Australia's largest um, car companies. And so obviously not an Australian manufacturer because we don't have him here anymore, but mm -hmm. he's from overseas, et cetera. And I asked him the question, within the context of your company, who do you, who do you actually believe has bought into the values of your company and really want to see it outworked through culture? And, he, and I said, like, you know, percentage-wise, when it comes to all of your executive members and leaders and and so, and he reckons maybe 15%. Oh, wow. And I'm like, that's very interesting, isn't mm. it? 
And the reason is, is because there's no spiritual element mm -hmm. to what's happening in that space, where we are very much about spirit. The reason we're meeting here in our house is, and I know initially we've talked about this before, there was pushback. It's like, can't we do it in the office or can't we do it in the church? And I'm like, no, this is where it's been happening for 25 years yeah. in our home. This is important. This is culture because we're not just working for the same boss yeah. being God, but we're actually family together. And in this place is where truth is imparted, spirits imparted, cultures imparted. Yeah. to the point where it can be taken away and replicated. And I really appreciate that, though. Part of your thoughts upon it there, it needs to be definable. You've always taken the time, when even when we don't understand why you're asking us to do this yeah, yeah. here, you've been able to define it or take the time. And I think that's so important yeah. um, to be able to express and share the why. Yep. The why, the why, the why. Yep. And uh, typically... Um, and I would say, typically, there's always a why with me. Yeah. And you probably, you probably <laughs> know, know. There's always a why. I think I had a conversation with a couple of characters over here uh, uh, just over the weekend. There's always a why. Always a why. And, um, you know, sometimes um, I'm surprised at how quickly I can drop the why when I'm asked. Because, like, I know, and you, you've worked me with for long enough to know mm -hmm. I want it like this, 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 this. And sometimes you will ask the why, sometimes Georgie asks the why, whoever can ask the why, and I'll be able to tell you why. There's always a why. If there's no why, then it can happen anywhere. But if I'm saying there's what I, why I want it done, there's a why. Yeah. I'm not saying it's right. <laughs> I don't get it right all the time. Yeah. But in me, there's a conviction as to why. Yeah. I want it done like this. This is why. That's cool. Yeah. On the home stretch here. Yep. So there's three chapters together that speak into difficult and challenging times. Yep. And this book is a faith story. It's an yep. enjoy story. It's your story. Yeah. Um, but these three chapters speak about the COVID years. Yeah. Your time of depression. Yeah. And your time on state and national executives. Yeah. Um, they're very interesting and vivid as I re even read them coming into this um, podcast, yeah. um, they're very vivid, the, what you share. Um, yeah. you're, you're very open in what you share. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you speak into that? Yeah, to a degree. To a degree. Um, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you look back, so what are we now? We're in mid-2024. Mm -hmm. um, my father has just passed away. I think I said on Sunday, you know, that for me, the last five years have been the, the most challenging five years of my life. And that is not an, that is not an understatement. It, 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 there's been no more challenging five-year period than this five years. The, um, the COVID years for me, and I, I made a comment as I was preaching uh, on Sunday, um, and I referred to Victoria being the socialist state of Victoria, mucking around, sort of mucking around. <laughs> it's like... Um, and then in the second service, I thought I'd better tone that down. So I didn't actually say it, but I did say what I said in the first service. <laughs> so you said it again. Said it again. <laughs> I don't, Victoria is not a socialist state, but there's no doubt about it. Some of the leanings and some of what happened during those COVID years was, from my point of view, overstretch. Like we were having laws put on us in a moment that divided us, mm. that divided the state, that divided families, that separated in a way that um, my grandfathers would never have thought possible. Mm -hmm. And it happened like that. Now, the reality, uh, the year after, we came out of two years of very severe lockdowns. Some say the harshest in the world. I think, um, to be honest, I think Toronto... They, they, they did it just as harsh. Um, um, in the free world, I think probably Toronto and, and Melbourne were there with the harshest lockdowns in the mm -hmm. world. I was getting asked halfway through 2022 when I was in America, what do I think the effects are on the psyche of the citizens in Melbourne? And um, I was saying to them, I don't know. But I have, <laughs> I'm laughing now. I wasn't laughing six months later. But I was saying to them, 
I don't know, but I have a feeling we won't really understand the full reality of what happened for five or ten years. Yeah. I said it in every... I went to four major cities, churches. I said it in exactly the same in all of them. Little did I know, within uh, six months, I'd be diagnosed with severe depression. And so... And I have no doubt that what happened during those two years played a very large part in it. Mm. Uh, in totality, no. You know me. I'm a sanguine. I love people. I mm -hmm. love... I'm a fun monkey. It's like... Let's get together. Let's have fun. Let's engage. Let's work out how we're going to change the world. And then to be locked up like we were and to be told, you know, if you're out after 8 o'clock, you're going to get arrested. It's like, and then, so, it just, it, it was harsh. For me personally, it was harsh. For so many, it was harsh. Like we, I walked out the street here one day and... So we're at the front of the house mm. and the lady from two doors down runs out screaming. Mm. Huh. I still get emotional mm. when I think about that scream because her daughter took her life during the night. We ran into the bedroom and the guy from next door, he was trying to um, get a breathing again, get a heart going again. And uh, the pain that that mother was going through, mm. you know. And I understand, I, I, I have no doubt the government thought they were doing what was right. But as someone who had to work with the people that were in pain, it was hard, bro. <clears throat> it was hard. And then so we did two years of that and then we come out and... Uh, we worked our tails off. I think, you know, I said to you on Sunday in, in the service, I thought we were working, I thought we did nine services on a Sunday, you said 10. In every nook and cranny at West. Yeah, there was, meeting, there was meetings going on, services going on everywhere, and so you preach and you preach and you preach and you're trying to, yeah, uh, you're trying to breathe life back into the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. We're allowed to come back and people were battered, people were hammered, people... We're in pain, and so but you're trying to reach them and bring them back in. So we worked our tail off um, for that first six months. I went to America, ended up getting vertigo for the first time, and um, can't stand up, vomiting in the streets, whatever the case may be. And uh, But I thought, just push on, <laughs> push on. And then I get diagnosed with de uh, severe depression, as I said, and uh, that uh, that uh, that was that was bar none the most brutal thing I've ever experienced in life. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's on as there's on the YouTube there. A, there's a message called 63 Days," where I talk about the fact that I went to see Doctor Emmanuel, started crying in the in his office and cried for 63 days straight, some days for three hours at a time, and you know, but the the the, the wonderful thing in it is worst time of my life but i'm strangely thankful for it because hmm. there was things in me that that maybe i needed to go maybe i need to go through that for god to be able to really deal with what he needed to deal with in me and i would say god is still dealing with some stuff in me in regards to that whole space and so that was that was brutal mm. uh, brutal on all of us uh, brutal on you because of seeing me go through it because you know who i am and that ain't me and but it was me, and like, and it's, it's interesting, you know. Where what are we going to do with our faith when they lock us up and they say you can't go out? As in, you know, it didn't stop me from doing what I had to do. As in, I just had to do it yeah. in a way that was um, half smart. Mm, that's right. I don't know if I'd call it all smart. I don't know that it's getting pretty serious in here, isn't mm. it? Because like, when, when it's in these moments so your faith is put to the test. Yeah. In, in the state and national executive spaces, my faith was put to the test. Everything I believed was put to the test. And um, 
I, I'm certainly not going to sit here and tell you that when the pressure came on in that space, COVID space, mental health space, that I did it all right, because mm. I didn't. Um, but it's one thing I do know. I stood for what I believed for. I believed in. At the end of the day, I hope my convictions are founded on Christ and his word. Um, because if they are, then as I, as the storms come, you'll stand. And that's where it all comes back to what do we actually believe? Mm. If faith is the essence of what we believe about God, what do we believe and how much will we stand? I ended up with blood on my sword because of what I believed. I believed there was a way to look after people, care for people, treat people. There's a way to do life. There's a way to do leadership. I ended up in trouble probably during COVID years because when I was told I wasn't allowed to leave my house, I left my house to look after people. And it's like, and some of that we could get signed off on, but some of it you couldn't. I have regrets in that, that I didn't look after more people. Mm. I have regrets that I was concerned about what people would think if they saw people come into our house and leaving our house. I should have just said, I don't care what you think. I have a regret that when I went to the Royal Commission mm. and I asked our QC if I could go across the, the entrance or the foyer and speak to a young lady who had been abused by, at the hands of people that should have been caring for her, I asked if I could go and, and say, I'm sorry for what you've been through. They said, don't go and say anything. And I didn't, and I reg regret it to this day. I regret it to this day. You know, faith is meant to do something. It's a walk of faith. I should have walked across that foyer and said, I'm sorry for what you went through. I should have been down there looking after that lady and her daughter with Georgie before that happened. Hmm. There's a lot of things I could have done better. But at the end of the day, you've got to keep walking. And so... You know, I end up with depression. Some of it was because of, you know, I'd lived life at 100 mile an hour. I'd uh, probably not dealt with some of the pain along the way to the degree that I should have. So I just loaded up, loaded up, loaded up. And then going through the COVID years, it just, I think it all paid a price and then I ended up there. Yeah. I don't necessarily think I needed to be there or go there. Mm -hmm. But I ended up there. But you've got to keep walking. And I think, you know, I've said, I think I might have said it in the book, not for a minute was I going to make depression a, a, a clo my closest friend or my nearest companion. And I'd encourage everybody, if you're going through mental health issues, see someone. You've got to go see the right people. Mm. Pentecostals, as in, I would say this about the church, we don't deal with mental health real well. Because mm. what's our answer to everything? Pray. Yeah, Pray. But go see your GP and get a, get a mm. referral. Go speak to people that can help you deal with some of the stuff that you need to deal with. Yeah. Speak to your pastors. Understand that your pastor is not a psychiatrist. Let the psychiatrist be a psychiatrist. And, you know, when I went upside down, Mike, I called me when I was having a really bad day. And uh, he suggested I do three things. I'm so thankful he did. One mm. of those things was speak to Arjun and Annie, our key assessors, who are both mental health experts, and then obviously uh, Dr. Lekin and Ayo came into our life, and uh, um, we already had Dr. Emmanuel and Vivian in our life, but all Nigerians, I refer to them as my Nigerian angels. He knew, yeah. God knew who to bring around me for that season, and um, they were able to help me in ways that the church wasn't able to help me, mm. and I thank God for them. Um, but you were also there, and the teams, and the, the church was there to help help us in ways also that was beautiful. As in, for me, I love the church. Yeah. I love the church. And it's like, yeah, I'm so thankful for the church. Yeah. yeah. It was... Sort of got heavy in here, didn't it? It did. It was... It, those chapters were yeah. hard to read. I can't imagine how hard they were to write. So I can promise you, <laughs> yeah, before you move on... <laughs> I made the mistake of sitting down and writing those three chapters in one day at Roasting Warehouse. By the time I got to the end, I was physically shaking. Yeah, wow. Like, it set something off. Yeah. And I thought, this ain't good. 
I'm not a doctor. I remember. I remember that day. <laughs> it was horrible because I'd been feeling way better. Yeah. But it was just one after the other, bang, 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 the three chapters. I was cooking on the inside. So at the end of the day, why did you write them and put them in the book? I think they're necessary. Yeah. The reason I think they're necessary because, okay, so whether you be the single guy, whether you be the, the married couple, whether you be the family, the business person, the minister, the pastor, whoever you may be, you can be walking a walk of faith and you can be trying to honour the Lord in the way you live your life. But sometimes as you go, as you journey, you find yourself in spaces and places, sometimes of your own doing, sometimes because of the doing of others, mm. that it's just not comfortable. It's, it's not good. It's hellish. Mm. And it's like, how, how have we arrived here? And it's like, but once again, it's like, you actually find out what you really believe when the heat comes on. You find, you find out what, you know, Peter and Silas, Paul and Silas, hanging in prisons, singing, singing worship songs to the Lord in the middle of the night. It's like, how did I end up in here? It's like, these are real men. You know what I mean? We, we read the Bible sometimes and we think, oh, that was harsh. But we didn't know that was real. Yeah. That was real. These are two brothers through no fault of their own as they're living their life of faith, get arrested, hung up in prison. What do they do? Do they sit there complaining and blah, 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 blah complaining about the, the, the city officials, the premier of the state? Is that what they were doing? No. They're singing love songs to Jesus. And everyone's like, what the heck's going on here? Then the Lord breaks them out. Mm. And it's like, we, we, and that's what, where faith comes into its own, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, and obviously, I, I've, you know, I'm interested in, in what's happening globally at the moment. Politics around the world is very interesting. Wars around the world are very interesting. Um, it's a very interesting time for planet Earth. My encouragement is don't get too caught up focusing on all of that. Mm. Keep, stay, stay, stay focused on the last thing Christ told you to do. do the it. last thing Christ told you to do. Mm. For me, I don't hear from God every day. I know what God has told me to do. I just got to go do it. So what are you doing tomorrow? What he told me to do last? I've just got to keep doing what he's told me to do until he comes back. Now, he'll tell me little bits and pieces along the way, but at large... Just keep doing what God's told you to do. Stay focused on the main thing. That's cool. Keep walking by faith through the COVID years, through the depression years, through the movement years. Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep walking. I love it. It's two words. Only believe, but there's so many layers to that. Yeah. It's just like the Nike, just do it, but there's so many layers yeah, yeah. to just do it. Um, and really liked unpacking those chapters with you. The way you finish the book is very interesting for a book. I love it because it's not just sharing a story, but it actually t speaks into what and where you'll be walking into. And you finish with, I need to work on my marriage and family relationships. I need to work on my health. I need to work on my self-awareness. I need to remain planted in a Bible-believing teaching church. I need to continue to make myself accountable to others. I need to forgive and, and let some things go. I need to humble myself and remain teachable. I need to love and lay my life down for God as well as others. I need to look to the future with eyes of faith. I need to believe that God-ordained plans and purposes for my life are already being woven into chapter 2. Amen. Amen. That's a great confession. Good yeah. job. I've been praying you to confess that. Finally. <laughs> I've been praying this every day over my life. That's good. Okay, so maybe being too vulnerable, and maybe this is a word for whoever that's tuning in today. If I can be really honest, so you come through those years, those three chapters, and you start coming out of depression. The big question is, is there real... I know I wrote it in the book, but... The big question is, is there really a chapter two for me? Strange, eh? Mm. It's like, man of faith, believe in the word, da, 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 da. But you get to, a, so, okay, so I'm almost 60, 59 years of age. I look 27, so cross it, I bear, whatever. And it's like, 
it's like probably 37 now. 37 I've been saying now. it for 25 years. <laughs> so, but, but then you get to a point and it's like, is there more? Does God have more? I, I, I can tell you one of the things I'm so excited about at the moment is I know there is. But there was times where I was questioning, like, do I continue to believe like I've always believed or should I just start to settle? I don't want to settle. Mm. I don't think we're called to settle. Without a vision, people perish. And it's like, I'd encourage every husband, every family, every business person, every minister, make sure you're spending enough time in the presence of God to hear what he says about your future. Write it down, make it plain so that everyone can get up and go with it. Um, so for me, I, 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 I would say coming out of that, there was probably six to, I don't know, six to 12 months where to varying degrees, I had to battle this with the Lord and get the other voices out of my head. Mm. Um, but I'm glad I have. I'm glad we're here. And I, I know as I'm talking to people at the moment, there are so many people excited about different things at the moment. And uh, that's a great place to be here when you're just sitting with people and you're talking vision, looking to the future and yeah, cool. dreaming together. And it's like, wow, Lord, what are you going to do next? Yeah. Chapter two. Chapter it's going to be awesome. I only believe. Well, thank you for um, unpacking that. I, I'm, I've heard things today that I've, I haven't heard before, even after reading the book, even after spending <laughs> days with you throughout the week. So thank you. Thank you to everyone for tuning in to this episode of the Un Uncommon Leadership Podcast. Stay tuned for our next episode. Any ideas? Any, any hints? Any, any teasers? No. No? Well, you're going to have to... I can't to tell you everything. <laughs> I say to Georgia all the time, she asks me everything. I'm not going to tell you everything. Then you won't need me. <laughs> See, so, so if I don't tell you, I'll get to come back. It's good. Fair enough. I like it. <laughs> um, hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell notification so you'll know when the next episode comes out. Once again, thanks for joining us for this episode. We'll see you next time. Next time.